was a tornado the right aircraft for that environment? It was exactly the right aircraft. Indeed, there's, there's a huge misnomer, Mike, about the tornado and the first Gulf War and low-level flags. So first of all, on the first couple of nights, everybody, not almost everybody, was flying low-level. So on the first two nights, the, Amer the Americans lost two strike eagles yeah. at low-level. And people don't know that. They are two of the most, by what were then, the most modern, highly defended, high-tech aircraft. They lost two flying low level. They lost a number of A6s. Um, obviously, the Tornado lost uh, a number of aircraft, but everybody was flying at low level on the first few nights. The B-52s, there's a little bit from one of the B-52 guys, because I'm trying to explain that. People say, oh, the Tornado was doing these missions that were wrong. They're, no, they're dangerous. That's what yeah. we're trying to do. The B-52s were flying at 50 feet over the desert Christ. on the first night. And they've got, they're doing it on basically on radar. So they, they've got no kit that's meant to be doing that. The B-52's wingspan is, is it 185 feet? I think something like that. It's big. And they're <laughs> flying at 50 feet. And the, the guy who's describing it saying, there's a guy, the guy in the back saying, just be bloody careful. But that's, they were flying because everybody was terrified of the Iraqi Air Force, the Iraqi uh, air-to-air missiles. That's what our big fear was. And the Iraqi surface to air missiles, the SAM 3s, the SAM 6s, the SAM 8s, their radar guided missiles. We, that's what our big threat was. We didn't know what FLAC was, we didn't know what AAA was. Mm -hmm. So the tornado was designed to fly at ultra low level into the heart of an airfield and drop JP 233. And that's what it was doing. And it did it really well. And people said, oh, well, it didn't work. Or it, but nobody, there's no real uh, evidence that what we do know is that. The Iraqi Air Force stopped flying yeah. in any real numbers very quickly. And that's because the Tornado Force, which was, in American terms, a small part of the force. I think, mm -hmm. what did we have in the end, 60 tornadoes out there or something? I think it was about that towards the end. The, the, we were, the, the, the Allies were putting up between two and 3,000 sorties a day. Right. A day. Two and three thousand, and so sending six tornadoes to one airfield and six tornadoes <laughs> to another airfield, you know. It, but it was part of an overall campaign. The campaign was to ground the Iraqi air force, so that the troops on the ground were not threatened when they put their boots on the desert and crossed the border. And everybody has forgotten about this in their hindsight expertise. They just don't understand. The tornado was the right aircraft, and it did the right job. And it, once that job was seen to have been done because the Iraqi Air Force stopped flying. There was no intelligence to suggest there was a, any particular reason, but they stopped flying. Mm -hmm. Then it went on to do other things. Now, medium level bombing in a tornado was not what it was designed to do, but it did it. And then, of course, very quickly, buccaneers were rushed into the region to provide laser targeting. And I talk about that and the reasons why it happened. And more importantly, the reasons why it didn't happen in the first place, because they're they, People, again, don't understand it, but they're there. And then, of course, uh, TIALD, the Tornado uh, Laser Designation System, Infrared, came in as well. So everything was being rushed into service. So the Tornado developed in what would normally have taken, I don't know, five years. It developed in five days, ten days, in the course of war, of what it was doing. And it was it, So it did its job, and the guys who did it did it amazingly well. I didn't. I was sitting on my fat backside in Baghdad by then. Yeah, let's talk about your famous incident. Uh, has it followed you around all your life? Do you ever get questions or not get questions about it? <laughs> it does. I mean, it's one of those things that it's, I, you know, I, obviously you'll have the picture somewhere. Um, you know, myself and John Peter shot down, captured, tortured, paraded on TV. Uh, so in one way, it was the worst moment of my life because it just signaled everything had gone wrong. So uh, the attack had gone wrong. I, I'd made a mistake on the attack run and the bombs hadn't come off the aircraft. So that had gone wrong. Then three minutes later, in an in, not connected incident, but three minutes later, heading, uh, heading out of the theater, we were hit by a heat seeking surface to air missile. So we were shot down. JP luckily managed to save both of my pilot, save both of our lives, because we were uh, we nearly hit the ground. Um, we were captured, we were interrogated, we gave in to the interrogation and then paraded on TV. So first of all, when it happened, I had no idea what it meant. I knew that 
there was a gun against my head and I'd been threatened with execution if I didn't do it. But I had no concept that it would become one of the, oh, you can probably call yeah, it, one of the, the most, yeah, there. Uh, one of the most famous images of, uh, of conflict. Um, and it, so it was, a, it was the worst time of my life because for me, it signaled failure from the failure of the attack right through to the failure of re not resisting interrogation. Mm -hmm. But there is no doubt about it that I would not be talking to you about book number 17. Yeah, I know, Seven yeah. 17. <laughs> I know, you know, I've got an English O-level from 1979. That's the limit of my writing skills, <laughs> my English O-level. And, and 30 years on, it, you know, I'm, now, I'm still writing about completely different experiences. So I, it's kind of life sliding doors. Um, I don't know what I would have been doing if I hadn't been shot there. But I wouldn't be talking to you about book number 17. So <laughs> it has followed me about a bit. And in some ways, and it's one of the reasons I wrote the book, it detracts from everybody else who did a brilliant job flying the tornado. JP and I, you know, not so much uh, after one, you know, half a mission. Um, uh, but all the other guys did an amazing job. So it's important to, to remember their contribution, really. Absolutely. And uh, obviously, uh, um, it changed your life professionally in terms of writing and stuff. But it, did it change your outlook on everything else? A little bit. Um, so I, I don't want to sound too kind of grand, but when you have faced death, and when you have thought, I am now going to die, and that happened to me probably two or three times uh, during captivity or capture and captivity, where I thought, okay, my life's over. I am now going to die. That does give you a kind of a curious perspective on what is uh, and isn't important. Uh, but it hasn't, it hasn't really changed anything kind of grand for, for want of a, uh, a, a so you better... You don't go outside and like, oh, that's a tree. You don't do anything like that. <laughs> I, I do remember, and everybody said this, kind of in the darkest days of captivity, I mean, in the really, really bad times, uh, kind of pray. I was, I, I was brought up as a, in a religious uh, uh, household, Catholic, and I went to a Catholic school. Uh, and I re but I was, you know, I was lapsed. I didn't do any, I had no interest in religion. Yeah. And it, but everybody said this. Everybody said that they prayed and they promised to, in the darkest days, in the most terrifying moments, mm -hmm. they prayed to whatever God they had been previously taught about. <laughs> and they said, everybody said the same thing. If you get me through this, I'll be a better person. And it kind of lasted for about 10 minutes after we were released, <laughs> to be perfectly honest. Absolutely.